Hi, this is Roy Oppenheim at Zoom at Noon. This is our sixth uh, webinar that we are doing during the coronavirus. Uh, this is put together through the help of Paola Vergara, one of my associates, and my son, Lance Oppenheim. And I want to thank you both for, for helping with me today to get this done. What we've been doing here, for those who've been uh, involved with this process, a number of you have been, uh, is that we're almost creating a mutual time capsule of what folks, our children, our grandchildren, who may be able to look at what we were going through at the time. At the same time, contemporaneously, we're trying to give ourselves uh, an update on what's going on. We're also trying to give ourselves some hope and some optimism that this will come to an end like every one of these crises in the history of mankind has. And of course, what we come out of this, when we come out of this, things are gonna be a little bit different. And we are trying to figure out how to position ourselves now, how to stay safe, and how to be able to be happy and, and prosperous when this, this crisis is over. As most of you know, this is an interactive process. We love questions, we love comments, we love feedback. Uh, it is not the easiest to stand here and talk in a screen and, and just look at a PowerPoint for an hour. And so it's really helpful when you participate and share and this becomes a, a joint collaborative effort. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about, uh, slide two, uh, the pandemics in history, the weekly unemployment, updates on federal and state aid and the lack thereof, industrial production and other market indicators, retail spending, the domino effect on real estate, real estate areas that are at higher risk, current legal first aid for real estate, and the future going back to a normal issue. What we're doing is kind of setting the predicate to understand how all of these issues, both the history and where we currently are and what's going on, is going to affect what real estate looks like currently and also in the future. Next page. As many of you know, we were at the forefront of the last economic crisis. Uh, we defended hundreds, thousands of homeowners who were in foreclosure, work, doing workouts, doing short sales, doing modifications, defending foreclosures, doing deed and lose, and time suing the banks for, for inappropriate behavior. Uh, we're starting to see some of this inappropriate behavior crop up again, but in, in a different context, which we will be talking about. Our firm was founded in 1989 by my wife and law partner, Ellen Polelski and myself. Jeff Sherman is a partner. If we go to the next slide, uh, we also have Mia Singh and of course Paola as, as our associates. And we have Wayne Patton, who's of counsel, who will actually be speaking next week with us about trust and estates during the, the virus pandemic. And we'll talk a, a little bit about that at the end. Next page. Oh, and more importantly, Zach Shulman is going to be joining us again as we talk about the importance of a bankruptcy strategy when dealing with uh, a landlord that is not being cooperative in the context of the middle of this crisis. Next slide. Uh, our last discussion was about steps we can proactively take to adapt and survive. This week, we're gonna talk about and take a deep dive into the consequences of the pandemic on real estate. Uh, Daniel Hale, chief economist for realtor.com, just recently said that the impact of COVID-19 materialized in the later half of March, just a few weeks ago. Week by week, we are seeing decreases in new listings, Sellers who don't have to sell right now are rethinking listing their homes. Buyers who aren't under pressure to purchase a home are also pulling back. So the number of listings has, has dropped precipitously. The number of buyers out there also isn't really clear because of the stay at home uh, requirements. Another factor I wanna mention is that since last week, there have been huge family offices and hedge funds that are creating massive, massive billion dollar funds for distressed real estate. Uh, Sam Zell, who is called a grave dancer, who has been involved with economic crises over the last 30 years, is also involved, and, and we're seeing a lot of folks who are going to be proactive as opposed to reactive and not defensive as it relates to uh, how they're going to deal with, with distressed real estate. We have our first question. I want to read it to you all. When do you think homeowners will be comfortable allowing purchasers, appraisers, inspectors to come into their home again? Uh, within the month, three to six months, six to 12 months, rarely... Uh, but virtual tours will become the norm. A uh, few folks are saying, uh, about a quarter of you are saying within the month, and about half of you between three months and 12 months, and 16% and or 15% think that it, people coming into your homes uh, may not be that that likely, again, that's only 14%. So we're seeing anywhere between three and 12 months worth we're thinking. Um, I wanna mention that, that the other areas that these distressed uh, hedge funds are, are creating right now uh, is in the area of, of malls, offices, as well as distressed debt, meaning the debt that's being used to finance 
malls, offices, and other kinds of real estate that, that's going to be hobbled by, by this crisis. Uh, let's go to pandemics in history. I think it's kind of an interesting uh, um, slide seven, if we can, uh, uh, chart here, which, which we thought we would share with you all. If we take a look, this is a, a, a roadmap of, of history. The, the history uh, of the most current is in the forefront, and in the back, of course, is, is what, what's happened in the back in terms of, of, of viruses. And as we can see, COVID-19 is at the very beginning of the chart right here. We can, which shows uh, that about 140,000 people uh, so far have, have died uh, worldwide. But if we compare that to HIV, that was around 25 to 35 million. And the Spanish flu, which everyone is comparing this to for the most part uh, in 1918, 1919, was 40 to 50 million people. So that was the last pandemic that had a rapid rise of, 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 of growth similar to, to, uh, to the pandemic we're currently dealing with. While HIV and AIDS has killed so many people, it's been over a long period of time since 1981 to present. So it's been a, a very extensive period of time while, while this virus has, has been rampant. And uh, that's why we, we frequently compare it to, to the Spanish flu. Uh, how is this pandemic measured in perspective? Infectious diseases, uh, outbreaks are nearly constant in human history. The agrarian model of living required uh, humans to settle in one place and live in groups. Diseases became, became spread in large scale. The more civilized humans became, the more we moved into cities, the more likely pandemics would occur because of trade routes, big cities, and social contact was much greater in, in these cities. Next slide, please. Uh, go to slide eight. Here we go. Uh, again, we're looking at this, the size of, of this particular pandemic compared to the others. We see that COVID-19 is, is tiny in, in the, uh, sorry, uh, right over here compared to all the other uh, types of pandemics. But the growth of it and the speed by which it is, is taken over in the last few weeks is what, is what the concern is. It has moved very fast and, and because of its, its, its speed, it overwhelmed uh, our medical facilities and that's been one of the main, main concerns here. 90% of all kids right now are not in school in the world. And that's just an incredible number. While they may be homeschooled or they may be uh, working uh, online, it is an unbelievable number. You'd probably have to go back hundreds and hundreds of years to, to find so many children currently not in school during the school year. And of course, that creates tremendous dislocation for, uh, for workers who uh, have to take care of, of their kids. Next question. Okay, let, let's move on if we can. Uh, let me see where we are. Um, Oh, I, I did want to talk, no, just go back to the slide, please. Okay. I do want to talk about what's called the RO, and it's really important. That's called the r naught, and if you're not familiar with it, that's a mathematical term on how contagious diseases uh, are measured. And so if you are below a one, that means that every time someone gets sick, they will only infect one person. At, at some points in time, this particular disease was measured at over three, where if one person got sick, three more people would get sick. Right now, different places in the country have different r naughts So for example, Atlanta, they believe it's well below one. New York is hovering around one. In South Florida, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but the reality is, is that will determine how, how things evolve uh, and will determine when different parts of our communities around the United States open. Okay, I uh, just wanted to share some pictures with you from the history of, of pandemics. This was uh, during the, uh, the Spanish flu in 1918, 1990. These were huge facilities where sick patients were recovering together or, or where they were uh, being held so they, they, wouldn't, they were isolated so they wouldn't continue to infect the rest of the public. This next picture is fascinating. It's in San Francisco, 1918, 1919. Actual court hearings were held outside. Outside obviously is a better place than inside because you, the likelihood of, of contagion is much less. And here you have an actual court hearing being held in the city of San Francisco sometime in the uh, 1918, 1919. Of course, uh, here we have baseball during the, the, uh, the Spanish flu in 1918 was actually played. Uh, as you can see, the, the, there is some, some precautions being taken by the masks that are being worn by the players. We have question number two, if we can. When do you think, oh, here we go. Do you think that people will migrate from cities to suburbs due to social distancing? Yes, no, or unsure. Okay, so about a fifth of you think you're unsure, 44, 43% said yes, 37, 38. So, so we're kind of split between uh, yes and no and that there may be some migration. And there are always migration to Florida regardless. But it's, it's certainly clear that for the time being,
people are, are, have left big cities and are going to areas where, where there's more space between, between human beings. But the excitement and, and, and the, the kinds of economic activity that historically have occurred in the city will ultimately attract people back. And we have cities that have ebbs and flows over the years. New York has come, gone, gone again, come again. And so it probably will take several years uh, for these cities to bounce back. But they're very resilient or organic entities that, that have the, the capacity to, to rebound. Next slide, please. Weekly unemployment update. Let's take a look at this. So, so here we have a, a, a chart from 2004 to current of what the unemployment claims have been each week. And these are actually uh, three or four lines here, the orange lines. And it just shows you how they spike. Nothing compared to 08, 09, which was the last time we had the Great Recession. And so we're seeing that, that this is going to have some sort of dramatic, traumatic impact on, on the community, on the economy, and, and clearly on real estate uh, for, for some period of time. And the reason it's going to have an impact on real estate is if people can't afford uh, to get a new mortgage or can't pay their rent, it's going to have an impact on the valuation of, of real estate because real estate ultimately is valued by, by uh, the, the cash flow and income that's generated by that type of real estate. Uh, and of course, many of people have applied for unemployment does not mean that many people have received unemployment. We'll go to question three. And that question is, if you have applied for unemployment, is it yes or no that you have actually received your, your first unemployment? I'll read it again. If you, if you apply for unemployment, have you received any, any compensation? There's almost no one. No, there, no. Almost no one says yes. Um, so almost no one, no one has received their compensation. There are other states where people are receiving their compensation. Florida has just been remarkably slow and somewhat incompetent in trying to get this process going. And they're just being overwhelmed. And, and I do understand that it will be retroactive, but the problem is that people have to hang on till, till they receive that first check. Let's go on to an update on, the, on, on federal and state aid or the lack thereof. Let's go to page 16. Uh, first one was the Florida bridge loan. I'm not gonna spend any time on this. It was a complete joke. Uh, only 100 businesses may have benefited from it. Uh, they, they touted it as, as, as the initial panacea and in one of the first programs. Uh, literally, it was a joke. Uh, and of course, you have the, the IDLE program also, the Florida Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. That also was, was a joke. Uh, none of these programs uh, did what they were supposed to do, and virtually no one that we know uh, received any, any kind of benefit from these programs. Uh, the PPP is another, uh, another issue. Uh, as of April 16th, uh, the $350 billion had been completely expanded. Uh, Congress right now is supposed to add another $250 billion to the program. There are lawsuits that have already been spawned by the program because uh, small businesses are accusing the major banks of favoring large companies, uh, favoring uh, those companies that were borrowing millions and millions and millions of dollars under the program as opposed to small businesses that maybe we're only going to borrow 50 or 100,000. The larger the businesses, the more capital and more access to debt that these large companies had, yet small business is the heart of America. And the program was supposed to be to help uh, Main Street and to help you know, our local dry cleaners, our restaurants, our nail salons, our barbers, all the people that we interact with almost on a daily basis. And so the program has been a, a miserable failure from that perspective. Even when they do reignite it, it's still going, a lot of the money is still going to go to the larger companies. And that brings us uh, to, uh, I think, in the next question that we have. And that is, um, how many public companies do you think received money from the, uh, the PIP program? Zero, 20, 40, 60, or, or 80 companies. <laughs> okay. Some folks say 20, some folks say 40, some sick folks say 60, and over half of you say 80, and that half is correct. Always go to the group when you don't know. Um, Shake Shack returned their money, but that's because they wanted to make sure that they uh, weren't going to uh, receive the, the kind of condemnation that many larger companies have, including like Ruth Chris, uh, that, that took an inordinate amount, amount of money. Um, when the funds do come out, the $250 billion, we're told that, that that money will literally dissipate in a matter of seconds or minutes because most of the money has already been committed. It just is now waiting almost like at a racetrack for the horses to come out and the first horses that come out of the track will be given the money and that money is gonna disappear in such a quick pace that it'll be like a blink of an eye. So uh, many people who've applied for the PPP probably will not get their money. It's ironic because uh, in, in many situations, folks who banked at smaller banks did better than the folks who largely banked at bigger banks and that's because big companies were also banking at big banks and they were favored by the big banks. And so 
the whole thing is, is, is very unfortunate. Let's go to page, slide 19. Um, I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time here, but this is an excellent article for the very few of you who may have gotten the PPP. It's very complicated on how uh, to spend that money to make sure that if you don't mess up, you won't have to pay it back. Or if you do mess up, you'd have to pay a portion of the loan back. This also goes to the question of uh, people asking me if you were an independent contractor, should you apply for the PPP or apply for the unemployment? Well, the answer is of course logical. You should not apply for the PPP because the likelihood that you're gonna get is like winning the lottery. You should apply for unemployment because there you will eventually get it. It's just a question of when and how long as opposed to the PPP where you could apply for it and the likelihood you're gonna get it is almost nil. But this is a good link for anyone who did get the PPP and wants to know how to, how to deal with it. In terms of individual benefits, um, the good news is that Florida has removed the requirement to report uh, in every two weeks, but workers are still required to give notice when they, when they find a new job or get new income. Obviously, if they don't do that, that would be a form of a perjury and, and they would actually owe the money back, obviously. Next page, industrial production and other market indicators. Page 21, okay. Two. Oil. This is very interesting. It, it, I believe at our very first uh, webinar, we talked about the construct of, of uh, deflation or negative interest. And the concept of negative interest, of course, is that when you borrow money, instead of you having to pay interest, you receive money. And it's, and it, and it's kind of almost ironic or, or, or puts normal norms, it puts it on their head. Same thing with oil here. What, what happened yesterday is, the manufacturers and producers of oil were paying people to actually take the oil off their hands and, 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 and put it in tankers. So that meant that, that the people who were receiving the oil were actually being paid to take the oil. And uh, this is not an unusual circumstance in, in a, in a uh, pandemic where there is massive price deflation, where there's radical price reduction across the board for commodities, labor, and also finished goods. And we saw that with the Black Plague, and we talked about that last week, and here we have it, a perfect example of what, what can happen. But that means also there'll be a price reset, not just on oil, but also on real estate, finished goods, professional services, and everything is going to reset and is going to adjust based on the new norms. But this is a perfect example of what we're talking about. And we can expect similar situations in particular areas of the real estate market. And that is why billions and billions of dollars, as I mentioned earlier, is going into these, these vulture funds right now because a lot of real estate will be sold off at 50 cents, maybe even less on the dollar. And, and we've talked about which those sectors are and we'll go back to them in a few minutes. Uh, as we've indicated, Florida could soon see depression conditions. That was a major headline in the Sun Sentinel just a few days ago. And they were actually talking about what Florida life was like during uh, the depression. Back then there was not air conditioning, or there was very little air conditioning, so obviously things were less comfortable uh, and, and there, were, there was clearly more homeless. I, I don't think we'll see a massive increase in homeless, but we will see a massive increase in evictions, a massive increase in foreclosures. We will see families doubling and tripling up, which could actually be a problem if we don't get a vaccine soon enough because we could have community spread within our own community bubbles and that would be very unfortunate. Uh, if we do look at the unemployment right here, we do see it going down slightly. Uh, some of that may have been because of uh, difficulty people being able to log on. Also, it may be because uh, most of the major industries in the tourism industry and in the restaurant industry and, and other service industries took their hits already. But the folks now that are being laid off are typically white collar, blue collar. And, and frankly, we're seeing a lot of lawyers who's, uh, who are being furloughed. And why are they being furloughed? And it's simple. There's less crime, therefore you have less defense lawyers. You have less car accidents, you have less insurance companies having to defend lawsuits. You have less plaintiff's lawyers who are suing the insurance companies because there's, they're, they're less active. So across the board, you're seeing that because there's less activity, there's less legal work, and therefore there's less need for the use of lawyers. But this doesn't just deal with lawyers. This will also go to accountants. It will also go to appraisers. It'll, it'll, it'll cross the board that as activity slows down, the need for white collar and, and professional class individuals will diminish. And so you will have furloughs, you will have layoffs, and, and you'll have people who are, who are just taking salary slashes for the time being. Florida. Uh, Florida saw, saw a hard hit during the last few weeks. Uh, numbers of unemployment were, were uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, the most important thing is, is that uh, Florida was really not prepared to move to a remote workforce such as states like California, New York, and Washington, where the virus also hit hard, but a large percentage of the population was prepared 
to be productive to work at home. But Florida really had never truly had to deal with that, although during hurricanes we had it, but since they were short-lived, people and companies didn't really think about creating a, a virtual office uh, environment where the bricks and mortar was almost secondary to the existence of the very entity. Let's talk about retail spending. This is kind of interesting, and it also goes to the value of, of retail operations, malls, and, and strip malls, of course. Uh, so uh, let's start on the left, if we can. Uh, are more people drinking coffee now? With Americans staying at home, here's what they're buying. Well, they're buying a lot of coffee filters. Vinegar, I, I'm not sure about. Pretzels, that's interesting. Hand lotions, understandable. Hair coloring, well, more, you know, what, it is what it is. Nail polish, the same thing. And baking mixes. A lot of people are, are baking, and I understand there's actually a shortage of, of, of big bags of flour. Uh, money is still flowing, but it's shifting to where it's going. Uh, the personal care products, baking supplies, and millennials and Gen Zers found that there are coffee makers outside of Starbucks. Uh, some interesting numbers uh, in retail spending. Well, people in New York are obviously not taking the subway much. Uh, there's just a massive decrease in overall traffic all over the place. Uh, there's a nice decrease in air pollution, particularly in New York. Uh, people are volunteering more, even though they're not leaving home or they're leaving home maybe just to volunteer. Pet adoptions has probably been the, the, the most important thing is, is a lot of the, uh, the, the places where people uh, adopt pets from have, have been emptied out. Because uh, And then uh, use of electricity has decreased because uh, of, of, of people not using their offices as much. And so uh, some benefits, uh, some industries are benefits and, and other folks are, are going to be repositioning and it's important to understand these, these issues. Uh, next question is question five. What is the cost of an average hotel room today? Is it $16, $32, $75, or $99? Yeah, I got you all on this one. Okay, so 9% said $16, 32% said $32, 34%, 33% 70%, 75%, and, and, and a quarter of you said 99 Unbelievably, the average hotel room currently in the United States is $16. Actually, it's like $15.64, according to something I read in the journal this morning. Uh, the occupancy rates are so low that these rooms are, are, are currently virtually worthless. So let's keep going. Domino effect on real estate. Okay, so we talked about our big cities losing their sex appeal, a number of you thought that for a while they may, but of course, as we talked about, cities may come back. The pandemic revealed the fragility or densely populated areas. Densely populated real estate has more aggregated costs, such as HOAs, taxes, mandatory community services, et cetera, et cetera. Buyers are looking for more space between one another, and developers have to rethink about going up versus uh, other types of, of real estate that would allow for more space and for less social contact, either in elevators, hallways, laundry rooms, and, and, and areas that, that, that could spread uh, communal diseases such as the virus that we're dealing with. Of course, do we plan for something that's gonna occur in another 100 years, or are we concerned that this kind of a situation could happen again in a few months or in a few years, depending on, on how we, we were able to resolve this with a uh, particular vaccine? One thing I wanna mention is that uh, as we do create new living spaces, that, that, that homes are gonna be reconfigured to also be secondary, uh, secondarily workspaces. Architects are going to need to redesign living spaces and developers are gonna to have to rethink how we organize ourselves as a community. Another question, are we have a, oh, you have a question? No. Oh. I tried to apply through a credit union and, the, and Bank of America where I have, I've had personal accounts and I was rejected. It said they could not process my request as I don't have a business account with them. Any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, my, my, my thought is that, that they're a bunch of idiots and, and that it's just terribly unfortunate that, you know, they're, they're treating you that way. The, rea the reality is they're trying to protect themselves from fraud and they want to make sure that they have an existing business relationship with their borrower because they're concerned that even though the SBA is guaranteeing the loan and, 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 the repay the grant, and is going to pay the grant, they want to make sure that they're not accused of not having fulfilled their due diligence. And because of the speed by which they had to process their loans, they want to make sure that they had some flags that they could use to say, okay, these guys we know, they've been doing business with us, their accounts have never had an issue, we feel comfortable 
uh, having them go through. So it really depended on the extent and nature of your business relationship. But I know a lot of folks who had good, strong business relationships with the larger banks, and they also got rejected. So don't feel bad. Any other questions? Or? Okay. Uh, let's talk about hotels a little bit more. Uh, the need for social distancing goes directly against the central idea of the hospitality industry. Hotels and short-term rentals are trying to cope with, with creative new offers. We have on the left here a hotel room that is being offered for a day rate for you to use it as an office. And this is uh, one, one concept. Uh, in, in Spain, uh, we saw some bed and breakfasts that are being used as convalescence facilities for folks who uh, maybe are recovering from the disease or were exposed to someone with the disease and they don't want to expose it further to their family. And so they're, they're literally staying in their rooms in these, in these hotels and are convalescing there. And uh, other, of course, uh, hotels have been used as hospitals. And, and so we're going to see major repositioning of hotels. Some will become residences. Others will be used for other, other unique, unique types of uh, situations. But uh, the hotel, as we know it, is going to morph into, into uh, subcategories of providing additional new services that, that weren't really needed, needed. And so we have him working under one roof and, of course, sheltering in, in, in our place. Uh, and so we are going to see massive foreclosures, repossessions, and workouts uh, in the hotels. And again, that's why... Uh, the large vultures have, have specifically targeted hotels as one of the, the first areas that, that are going to, uh, going to see massive uh, change in, 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 in as we come out of this crisis. Let's talk about strip malls. Well, in some strip malls, uh, the owners have borrowed money from securitized uh, trusts, and, and therefore, there is very limited uh, availability for the managers of those mortgages to provide any kind of a dispensation or or or, uh, or benefit to to the uh, the tenants, and and that's where we get into a, a problem with with how does a tenant deal with a landlord that is being uh, rather obstinate because they have a mortgage company that is breathing down their neck. Um, also, we have here a picture of the Mall of America is completely desolate. It's the largest mall in the United States, and the question is, how does a place like that continue to operate, and what is the value of that of that mall today versus uh, five or six weeks ago? This is very interesting, and this is, this is just coming about in the last day or two. Uh, we're seeing a move to, to try and protect the, the folks who are working in the supermarkets. Uh, they have an, a, an inordinate percentage of people who are getting sick and dying. Uh, Whole Foods, for example, already in Chicago, has closed one of their facilities, uh, and, and, uh, and it's only being used uh, for the purpose of, of delivery and, and pickup. Um, there's going to continue to be an ongoing discussion if supermarkets are a safe place right now, or if one should really just be uh, having your food delivered or have, have pickup. Walmart, I know, is doing is doing pickup, and I know many other folks use Instacart and other and other types of, of services to have their their um, food delivered. But the issue would be that if we change the supermarket construct to being pickup and delivery only, then do these uh, facilities need to be uh, in in the places where they are, which would be high traffic areas, uh, which have good exposure to. Uh, to, to pedestrian traffic and, and of course vehicular traffic. And the answer is they could easily then be in warehouses, which then means that, that those big boxes are gonna be, have to be replaced with other facilities and that the nature and, and, and quality of that kind of real estate could, could drop precipitously. Um, I, I, I do wanna mention that uh, the Whole Foods uh, in Chicago, you know, converted their, um, their place you know, converted their bar and their other facility for pickup. But what's interesting is that in Plantation, Florida, right here, they had done the same thing where they took out their bar, uh, but they did it a few months ago before this whole crisis happened. So there's already been a move afoot to have more pickup. Okay, we have a question. Should supermarkets moving forward not be open to the general public and continue to focus only on pickup and deliveries? That is the question. So about a third of you are saying yes, and two thirds of you like the experience, as do I, of going and squeezing your own tomatoes and making sure your bananas aren't too ripe or not ripe enough. And we'll see if that's something that, that we still are going to be able to experience uh, and for how long. And that's a very interesting question. And its impact on real estate is, is dramatic, is dramatic. Okay, let's talk about big shopping malls. Um, the uh, Demise or survival of big shopping malls is one of the biggest economic uncertainties. Are we uh, going out? 
are we going to go out and run, run around like we're freed herds when this, when this problem is over, or are we going to continue to use uh, virtual services, delivery, curbside pickup, and online shopping? And the answer is probably going to be something in between, because it isn't going to be like we're going to go from a red light to a green light. It's going to go from a red light to different shades of red, to different shades of yellow, to certain dark greens, and, and you know, at what point are we going to have this full green light? And the answer is we won't get that full green light till there is herd immunity or in the alternative where there is a vaccine. And, and that will take months, if not a year or two, as we all now know. Uh, as you all know, and probably have heard, and we had talked about this weeks ago, that, that some of the big box re retailers weren't gonna make it. Neiman Marcus just announced, I think last night or this morning, that they are in fact going to go bankrupt. Uh, they may be acquired by one of their competitors, that's unclear but Neiman Marcus was going the way of Barney's even before this crisis. And so some of the folks and some of the things that we're seeing is just an accelerated process of what was going to happen regardless of, of this uh, pandemic. And so even the move to uh, working at home, big companies have already been working at home for years. The Google and the Facebooks have been operating almost right now as a virtual company, even though they have massive, massive office spaces they've been able to do this for years. And so it's really the little guys and the rest of us who haven't joined that bandwagon that have done so in a, in a, in a pace that we haven't seen since probably the industrial revolution where there was just massive, massive change. The changes we're seeing are probably the same kind of changes when we went from kerosene to an electric light bulb. And the change of that initially was slow and then it happened so fast that in the blink of an eye, you, you, you went from hurricane candles and, and hurricane, uh, uh, whatever the hurricane lamps as they're called, to, to the electric light bulb. And I think we're seeing here this massive move from people in an office congregating every day to working at home yet still being a, a, a viable business or a, thrive, or a thriving business. Uh, let's talk about office space. You know, it's very interesting. I mean, in the past, you know, no one thought twice about going into an elevator. No one thought twice about the HVA system and whether or not the air was being circulated among the entire building or just the folks next to you. No one worried if they were next to a medical office uh, and if you were breathing in their air. I mean, these are all major issues. Or if you use, or if you have your own private bathroom within your office, or if you have to use a public bathroom where, where the exposure to germs would be exponentially higher because you're getting all the germs from, from everyone who uses that bathroom. Um, these are the types of questions that landlords are going to have to address, and they're going to have to address them very quickly. Uh, some folks are thinking that, that HVA systems are going to have to be per office. Some people are talking about using uh, ultraviolet light to make sure that, that, uh, that the air is, is properly uh, cleansed and, and purified so that uh, the virus can't go through the HVA system. I think we're recognizing now that this virus isn't just a matter of touching your face. It is, it's clear that, that it's, it's aerosoled, it, it's, it's almost vaporized, and that if someone is talking to you too closely, if they're breathing on you, if they sneeze on you, that those micro air droplets can travel quite substantially. Of course, they can't draw, travel as much outside, and that's why you had the San Francisco courthouse that was operating in 1918, 1919, yet you didn't have a, a trials that were going on in 1918, 1919, or now in a courthouse, because there's a, a, a common perception and knowledge among the scientific community that this thing can spread from person to person just by breath, by sneezes, by coughs, et cetera. And so obviously being outside is clearly better than being inside. And that's the negative impact of, of the office space environment for the next year or two. Let's talk about current legal state, legal first aid for real estate. Okay, I wanna talk about first uh, appraisals. I, I put here BC and AD. BC means before Corona and AD means after the disease. So anyone who gives you an appraisal before the virus, from a legal perspective, from just a, someone who's observing the, the community right now, that appraisal is worthless. And so a real appraisal needs to be done right now in the current crisis. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how an appraiser takes a massive 100 year event and incorporates it into the valuation of, of real estate. To say that you're gonna look at something that happened 90 days ago is like Alice in Wonderland. I mean, it's, 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 you're, you're in a different world. Um, it's almost like uh, the Wizard of Oz. I mean, you're, you're in a different world, a different environment. And so to use an old appraisal is, is, is nonsensical. AD, after the disease, we need to figure out how real estate's gonna repeg. And as realtors, many of you are realtors who are on the phone today, you, you, on, in the presentation today, you need to properly advise your clients that, that they need to be cautious about using an old appraiser. Inspections, people getting into homes is, is difficult, but not impossible. Obviously it's happening. 
uh, surveyors uh, generally can work outside, so that's that's okay. And closings, uh, our sister company, Western Title, we have been doing closings. We've been doing closings remotely, and and of course we've also been been doing closings uh, online and and also mobily. And we're going to talk about that because that's really a very important context. The idea that people are going to huddle in a conference room, we talked about this weeks ago, is going by the wayside. There are some folks who are still doing it. I don't think it's a good practice, and I I would highly discourage it. Next, please. Okay, so this is very interesting. It's kind of in the weeds, but it's really important. Um, before the crisis on January 1st, the state of Florida allowed for something called remote online notarization. And that meant that you could have a promissory note, a mortgage, and all your documents electronically executed on, on, a, on, a, ta on, a, on a tablet like this. There'd be no paper documents and that the documents would be recorded electronically. Unfortunately, other than for cash closings, this process has not gone over very favorably with most of the banks. The banks are still concerned that they would like an original wet ink note, and that's part of the hangover effect from the last economic crisis because they wanted to make sure that they weren't accused of photocopying, fabricating notes, so they wanted to have a wet ink note. The other thing is that even if they did have a wet ink note, which you could do through a hybrid closing, the banks were also concerned that they would want to have a wet ink mortgage, and even though the mortgage could be recorded electronically, they wanted to make sure that they had a wet ink mortgage. The problem with the notarization statute was that it didn't allow for notarization of wet ink documents. Now the note doesn't get notarized, but the mortgage does, as do some other affidavits. But a number of the title underwriters, and I guess with the Department of Insurance, determined that they would allow for remote ink notarization as opposed to remote uh, online notarization. And so now what you have it, remote ink notarization means that you have a notarization process that's not done through Zoom, it's not done through Facebook Live, but it's done through uh, specific portals that are geared for the industry where a notary is online, video chatting, uh, having been able to demonstrate who the individual is through, through uh, knowing your, your customer uh, software, similar software that, that in fact is used uh, by uh, the, the folks uh, who, who check you out at, at the airport. and. Um, once you determine that the person is who they say they are, they can sign the documents, but they also have to sign the documents electronically. So it's almost like two closings. You have an electronic closing as well as a wet ink closing that is notarized after the fact by the notaries when the, when the folks who signed the, the note, the mortgage, and the other documents throw it in a FedEx envelope, which has to be, actually be sealed on the video. And then after that, it gets sent back to the title company and they're able to close. But all this is done uh, in the, the comfort of your own home. Next page, please. We have a question. Oh, we, we do have another question. Hi, Roy. A summer repeat question to you from three to four weeks ago. We are mom and pop landlords. We cannot continue endlessly without rent. What do you expect to happen to individuals that have rental property? How do we recover? We financially cannot go without rent. We should not be considered evil landlords when this is our job. We have worked 30 years to get to retirement and rent is our only source of income. Savings were wiped out in 2008. The lack of eviction ability seems to border on a socialist or communistic structure. Do you anticipate lawsuits against the US government regarding the lack of control of your personal property? Okay, so first of all, you can't sue the government for, for this. It's a government action and you can never sue a government for government action. I will say that the history of the United States is that unlike any other country, we have provided the best rights to property owners anywhere. And that's why there's historically been this amazing flight of capital, worldwide capital, to the United States. So what we have to look at in this pandemic is, is the United States protecting property rights better or worse than any place else in the world? And the likelihood is we're probably slightly better in protecting property owners, uh, but in this worldwide pandemic, we're trying to make sure that no one is unnecessarily thrown out. What most landlords are doing is working, doing workouts with, with their tenants, trying to get them to pay something and trying to extend their leases or do something. Eventually the landlords will be allowed and will have to evict those tenants that have taken advantage or can't afford to stay there. It's just a question of when, and, and it's, a, it's gonna be a terrible situation, but what the government is trying to do is kick the can down the road as far as possible till at least there's a vaccine and until such time that the economy can recover so that people who currently can't pay the rent will have the ability to get a job and be able to recover somehow or be able to move in with someone else where they can, they can at least shelter in place. So it's, it's a terrible crisis. Um, I think in this particular case, everyone's in this together. The tenant is no better than the landlord. Landlord's no better than the tenant. Um, 
obviously what the landlord needs to do if they have a mortgage is to do something uh, with uh, their mortgage company. Uh, everyone needs to call their mortgage company. Landlords need to call their mortgage company. And then you have to work with your tenant. It, it, you are correct right now that if you bring an eviction action, while you could get a judgment, it is unlikely that in Dade or Broward County, or maybe even in Palm Beach County, that you will get a judge that is going to enforce a residential eviction at this time. Um, and then if the person chooses to go bankrupt, which we're gonna talk about, that could stymie things even further for the landlord. I highly advise that you get a good lawyer, whether it's us or anyone else, to help you navigate this particular situation. And it's a tough situation because we are representing landlords, we are representing tenants, we're representing borrowers, we are representing lenders, and we are trying to provide them the best uh, path for their particular situation. So there is no easy answer to this, and the whole thing is just heart-wrenching. But at the same time, uh, we are where we are, and we have to figure out how to extend this process so that we can, we can come out of this hole. Next question. Is there anywhere we can live that is not affected by this? Well, if you pull out the maps, you can see that some counties in this country have very few uh, uh, infected individuals or anyone who has died. At the same time, many of those places have terrible hospitals or don't have hospitals nearby. And so you're kind of rolling the dice saying, well, I'm going to go here because the likelihood is I'm not going to get sick from the virus. But if you have a heart attack, what is the likelihood that you're going to make it to a decent hospital? And so you, you also have to figure out how you're going to get there. Are you going to fly there? Are you going to drive there? But there are many places in the country that, that have not been terribly affected. And you can look that up very, very easily. Does your firm do asset protection work? And the answer is that Wayne Patton next week is going to be talking about trust and estates and of course, and of course asset protection planning, which go hand in hand. Um, let me, let me go up here. What do you think will happen uh, with the mall that they are building in West Miramar that is supposed to be bigger than the Mall of America? I have no idea, but the likelihood is that it's probably going to be built not as fast and not as quickly as anticipated. It'll probably slow down a few years and, and hopefully people will have short-term memories and, and things will somehow come back. But maybe not. But maybe not. And maybe there'll be precautions taken in how it's designed so that this experience incorporates itself into the very design of the building. Uh, let me see. With reference to your slide on the scale of pandemics throughout the years past versus COVID-19, is truly accurate to define this as a pandemic or could have been distorted into that notion? Well, I'm not an immunologist, um, uh, you know, so for me to answer that is, is, is a difficult question. Um, I think it was a pandemic because of its impact that it was having on the hospital system, not necessarily on the actual number of deaths, but the number of deaths that were projected. Here in the United States, had, had we not done the social distancing, we would be talking about a few million deaths ba based on the r naught number uh, and, and, and how quickly the, the disease was spreading. Um, okay, so I think we've talked enough about uh, Ron, and we'll talk a little bit more about commercial tenant, tenant and landlord relations. And I'd like to bring Zach Shillman in, on board now. Zach, are you, are you there, buddy? Zach, you there? Hi, Roy. Hi, Roy. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I, I want to introduce you. Zach, Zach is, is a good friend. Our firms work hand in hand. We're strategic partners in, in helping our, our clients in connection with landlord tenants as well as for, uh, bankruptcies in general. And there's a new section of, of the Chapter 11 code, Sub 5, that, that we're going to talk about as it relates to landlords that are trying to throw their commercial tenants out right now. Go ahead, Zach. Right, right. Thank you, Roy. Thanks again for having me. I think this is maybe my third or fourth special guest appearance, and I very much appreciate it, and um, you do a great job with this. Um, so just talking a little bit about bankruptcies, and, and, and we talked about this last week, and this, this also goes to the question on if you are a landlord. What I'm going to talk about is really more towards if you are a tenant, but if you are a landlord and you're getting pressure from your mortgage lenders, then you as a landlord, if you have multiple real properties, you could file a chapter 11 bankruptcy under this new provision, the sub chapter five provision, and buy yourself some time and also attempt to modify the mortgage uh, or mortgages on your property. So landlords are not without recourse you know, in bankruptcy. We talk a lot about tenants, but landlords can file bankruptcy too. Sometimes we have a situation where the landlord and the tenant are both in bankruptcy. Um, so, but anyway, what I'm going to talk about are, um, are the ramifications really from the, from the tenant standpoint. Um, and again, if, if, if lender pressure for landlords um, is, is heightened and, and keeps going and we're in this, you know, much, much longer, uh, landlords are going to exert 
more and more pressure on their tenants. And that's going to lead to, um, you know, three or five day notices, eviction lawsuits. And then the question is, what can we do in bankruptcy? So generally speaking, uh, as soon as as soon as a bankruptcy petition is filed, there's an automatic stay on all collection activity. So with respect to a commercial tenant, uh, if a chapter 11 bankruptcy is filed, it will prohibit the landlord from taking any action outside of bankruptcy court to repossess the premises. Uh, the one big exception is that a landlord is not stayed in bankruptcy and may seek to obtain possession with respect to a lease that has been terminated by the term of the lease uh, either before the case was filed, before the bankruptcy case was filed, or during the case. So what this means is that, you know, in some jurisdictions, a lease is terminated when there is a judgment of eviction. So timing is very important for tenants who are considering filing bankruptcy to stop an eviction or an eviction that might be happening in the very near future. You have to make sure that there's actually still a lease um, because if the lease is terminated, then the automatic still won't apply. So let's assume that a bankruptcy case is filed um, prior to a final judgment of eviction, the lease is not terminated, and the bankruptcy case is filed, and there's an, automa there's an automatic stay. And the question is, is what happens then? What rights does the tenant have at that point? Um, generally speaking, a, um, a, tenant can, a tenant has the right to disagree with what the amount is of rent. So if your landlord is charging you for multiple months of rent and you paid, or there's some other defense under the term of the, um, of the lease agreement, then you as a tenant have the right in bankruptcy court to contest that amount. Zach, However, let me, let me answer, can I ask you a question, Zach? Yeah. So in theory, one could bring impossibility, in, in, inability to uh, actually bring fruition to the lease because of, of municipal or state or, or local ordinances that prevent you from, from, from being available. And of course, you also uh, could have uh, force majeure provisions that 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 could theoretically kick in, and those could be defenses that you could assert, presumably in the bankruptcy court. Uh, I would imagine. Right. It would be in the form of essentially an, an objection to claim. You have the the same right to object to a claim in bankruptcy as you would um, in state court. So so any rights that you would have under Florida law or whatever state you're in you would have that right to contest a claim in bankruptcy court. And the beauty of, of this body of law is that pandemics don't have a good body of law right now anywhere in the country in terms of force majeure, impossibility. And there are suits popping up all over the country now in all different types of contexts where people are trying to change or break out of their, their, their obligations because of this mutual impossibility. I mean, the landlord can't provide quiet you know, quiet enjoyment because you can't enjoy the place and the tenant can't be there because their customers can't be there. So these are the kinds of things that could get worked out in bankruptcy and keep you in there and buy you the time that you need to be able to reopen and, and get your restaurant or whatever else it might be back on its feet. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And, and these are, and these are, you know, right now they're novel arguments, but they're arguments that absolutely a tenant will have the standing to bring in bankruptcy court. You know, the, the courts are still navigating through this. There's some uh, unique bankruptcy provisions that are being triggered uh, with this pandemic that, that attorneys are, are using. And, and attorneys are gonna need to navigate through those, through those unique uh, provisions. So, so just the bottom line, and, and I just wanna reiterate this, so the realtors are out there, the owners out there, the, 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 the tenants out there, uh, if you get a three day letter, you know, that's the beginning of your landlord saying that they're serious about possibly evicting you. If you get that complaint, it is at that point that we need to file the bankruptcy immediately because if they get a judgment on the uh, eviction, your bankruptcy will not protect you at that time because the lease then has been terminated by an order uh, of, of the court. And so we need to jump in at the right time. So the, the time to communicate with us is probably when you get the three day letter. And at that point in time, we have to then begin to create a strategy of how we're going to be able to keep you there. And how many days did you, did you say again that, that one could stay there, Zach, do you think, under, under uh, once you file? Well, yeah. So, so, so once you file, assuming that the automatic stay is, is, is in effect and the lease hasn't terminated, the, ne the next step is a tenant has to either assume the lease or reject the lease. Assuming the lease means you want to stay in the space and you want to take, um, you want to retain the benefits under the lease. You have, a, you have 120 days after the bankruptcy case is filed, so four months after the bankruptcy case is filed, to decide whether you are going to assume the lease 
or reject the lease. If you assume the lease after that four month period, that is when your back rent would be due. So, you know, and usually what happens is during that four month period, some sort of settlement is reached with, with the landlord. At the same time, you have to, you know, the, the bankruptcy rules require you to continue paying the ongoing post bankruptcy monthly payments and you have um, 60 days, within 60 days, so two months of the bankruptcy filing to um, begin making those payments unless the court extends that for cause. And again, this has never happened before since the uh, advent of the bankruptcy code in 1978. So, uh, you know, we don't have, we don't have a, a lot of history of, of cases to, uh, um, to look back on, but I would think that cause would exist for a judge to extend that deadline. And that four month deadline that I just mentioned can also be extended by another 90 days up to 210 days. So it's quite possible that, that by filing a bankruptcy, you can build yourself a considerable amount of time to either work something out with your landlord or repay the debt. And again, going back to, to the beginning with this new streamlined chapter 11 called subchapter five, it's very favorable for debtors who file. So um, it's not like the chapter 11s that you heard of before. These are really geared more towards the debtor's favor. And of course, uh, the, on slide 42, we can take a look. We could just address those four points real quickly. Yes. So, um, so when you are you know, negotiating with your landlord, you know, and this is really for prior to filing any bankruptcy, uh, you know, most leases come with personal guarantees. And you have to be really careful if, you are, if your landlord is trying to prevent you from filing bankruptcy and giving you extensions, but they want you to sign a personal guarantee, you, might, you, may, you may find yourself in personal liability by, or you will find yourself having personal liability by signing those guarantees. And you really want to see what your options are, because it might be that a bankruptcy for the company is better than putting yourself on the hook personally. Um, same thing with extending uh, the term of the lease. Um, you know, if your landlord wants to tack on another five years and you're not ready to do that, uh, again, you might be better off filing a bankruptcy than uh, adhering to whatever the landlord wants in, in that respect. Um, also analyzing the price of the lease against the current market prices. Maybe you don't want to stay in the lease. Maybe it, maybe it just, maybe the market rent, maybe the, the rent that you're paying is above the market rent and it doesn't make sense for you to do a bankruptcy and assume the lease. Maybe you should reject the lease. Maybe you should move out and then you deal with the debt, you know, another way. And then finally, uh, keep up with the current law and guidelines. So for example, um, you know, I know right now residential evictions are um, not happening. Commercial evictions theoretically could. Uh, before you pull the trigger on any bankruptcy, timing of any bankruptcy is usually uh, dictated by some sort of triggering event. And you want to make sure whether or not your creditor, and this goes for any, any creditor, is able to actually um, take, uh, do what they're threatening to do. So if you have a landlord that's threatening to evict you right now and you're you know, a resident, well, there's no need to file a bankruptcy because your landlord cannot follow through on the threat that they are making. So keep up with the current law. Keep watching uh, Roy's uh, Zoom at noon um, and uh, you'll be up on all the uh, current law. Zach, thank you so much. We have like five minutes left. I want to get through this and I want to open it up for questions. Listen, you're the best. Thank you. We'll be in touch Thank as well. Thank you very much. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Okay, let's go to slide 43. Okay, U.S. stimulus, stimulus may merely be a delay uh, for the virus foreclosure wave. And we've talked about this from day one. That's clearly going to be the case. We saw the exponential increase in, in unemployment. Ultimately, the floodgates are going to open. And at that point, it's, it's going to be a mess. And that's going to be both for evictions as well as foreclosures. There's somewhat of an ironic twist here. And I have to share this with you. And maybe no one else will find this in a perverse way humorous. But the folks who are at the biggest risk right now, this very moment, are not the homeowners, but the very servicers who were the villains in the last crisis. They are the folks that, in many ways, falsified documents to get people out of their homes. They're the ones who created fake assignments. They're the folks who, who illegally notarized documents that, that hadn't been properly notarized previously. And they are now at the brink of bankruptcy. And if they themselves do not get a bailout, they will go bankrupt. And so it's it, the irony that they're going to get a taste of their very own medicine uh, cannot uh, go by lightly here. And so 
uh, in some crazy way, we may have to bail them out in order to cre keep the economy going. But but the humor, the the irony, uh, can't escape those of us who um, had to deal with them and their uh, uh, inappropriate uh, and fraudulent practices uh, uh, last time around, uh, just ten or twelve years ago. Uh, let's go back. Let's going forward. Let's talk about what the new normal is going to look like. Um, Here's a, a school in, in, in Asia where students are back, but, but this is how they are now dressed. Uh, here on, on the street in New York, we, we're having uh, uh, folks uh, look at and maybe a stand that, that's still open right now, but it, you know, it is what it is. And then here we have uh, children dancing, but, but they're all wearing, wearing face masks, just like the, the ball players were a uh, hundred years ago when they were playing baseball. So in order to get uh, our, our communities back open again. The, the U.S. government has issued some guidelines that, that local municipalities, governors, and, and counties are going to have to follow. Um, there are a number of things that have to work. First, people are going to continue to telework at home. Uh, another thing is that uh, social distancing is, is probably going to be here for probably somewhere between 12 and 18 months. And eventually, when uh, proper protocols are set up and, and uh, we have uh, an, enough immunization in the community, things may go, get back to something that resembled what we previously once had. I think for the time being, you can kiss the middle seat in an airplane goodbye. The th A380 is, 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 is now going to be a terrible casualty of the crisis. 500 people going from point A to point B is an unlikely scenario anytime soon. In fact, uh, I was looking at how long it took for the aviation community to rebound from 9-11, which is catastrophic an event that it was, it didn't affect uh, major localities except those places that were particularly hit and and it took five years for people to feel comfortable to get back on airplanes to bring airplane uh, use to the level that, that it was and so maybe it, it's going to take five years here or maybe it'll, it'll happen faster but but who knows um, the other thing i think we're going to see in the office space market is that there's going to be more flex space instead of people having their own offices the office will be a place where people come to congregate but a lot of the work and heavy lifting will be done at, at home uh, are there any questions that we have out there or, or not? Let me see, we have one question. Okay. Uh, now that employers know their employees can work from home, office space is going to suffer immensely. Uh, I, I agree with that. I, I think that landlords are scratching their head about that. It's, it's going to be uh, something that, that's going to re repeg and the value of, of office real estate is, is going to dramatically change. We have another question here. What happens if the borrower is in the middle of a construction to perm loan for his home? The borrower now owns the land. The house is three quarters built and the borrower has a, has a change lower in income due to the virus. Can the bank now refuse to convert the loan? If you're in the middle of the loan, I don't think that, but you'd have to look at the loan covenants because sometimes you have to provide updates on your financials depending on the size of the project. But many times the bank is stuck and they have to continue financing. I'm not gonna read the rest of the question because it's a very long question. And I think we're, we're running out of time. Is there any other questions? Okay, so I just want to remind everyone, Zoom at noon next Tuesday at noon with Wayne Patton, who's of counsel of our firm, and we're going to be talking about um, trust in estates as well as asset protection planning in the time of COVID-19. Uh, Roy Oppenheim from the trenches, Zoom at noon. Thanks so much again for joining us. Stay safe, stay well. God bless. Thank you.